All right, so this is black to move. What should he do? Yeah, I don't want to, I'm stink, sometimes I stink up the dojo. People are talking about rook a8, rook a6. Yeah. Rook a6. First question would just be like, what are you going to do after rook e6? Uh, and then I guess rook a8. I don't, I don't know if I get it. You know, what about just like king c6? Simple problem. If white wins either the f pawn or the b pawn, it's going to be a hard life. Right? Yeah. If king c6, then rook a4. Well, what if you just play uh, king takes pawn, right? Not, it's still not going to be an easy life. All right. Someone Now, one of the things, let me just say this. One of the things that's been a bummer about the U.S. chess school is people have, uh, have sometimes been afraid to speak. I think Arian's ready, though, so I'm going to ask him. All right, Arian, what so, do you got for us? So I have this funny idea where you go king h5. Uh-huh. So then king c6. Okay, let's try it out. So king h5, king c6. Now rook a4. Okay, yeah. And then if you take the pawn, I play e6. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay, cool. No, I think you basically got it. I'm trying to see if there, there's a slightly different move order that I imagined it with, but I think yours is fine. So I was thinking you'd play, uh, <clears throat> like, honestly, I don't know if, I don't think the move order matters. Right, like uh, king takes h6, and then you got it. You could play rook a4 first, too, I think. Yeah. You know? Okay, very good. So uh, let me backstep that a second and just show the beauty of that. Very, um, you know, anti intuitive. And the, 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 the self stalemate stuff, it's as a, when you're told it's a problem, it's a lot of times easier than, uh, you know, when you're at the board. It's so hard sometimes to imagine. This, by the way, was a variation that Petrosian found from a game he played. It was, planning, it was a planned variation uh, in a game he had against Korshner, I believe, 1971. Okay, great, Arian. That was well done. Let's go to the next one. Oh, Oh, jeez, I'm already showing everything. <laughs> I'm already showing everything. I was, this position, okay, it's okay if I showed the first move. The first move might not be right. I spent some time looking at, this is very hectic. This is very hectic. This is a game that Anderson, the famous endgame player, played against Larson in 1975. And <clears throat> I think one of the things I wanna stress with this when I say endgame tactics is, you know, there's no firm di division in the middle game either between uh, strategy and tactics. But in the end game, <laughs> More so, I honestly, than in the middle game, it's possible to really do some deep lines, especially with pawn end games, but also in a in a variation like this. So, let's spend a moment here and um, imagine here is white to play. I'm always putting the person who is to move at the the bottom. This is Anderson as white against Larson as black, and. Let's imagine this. I think maybe I'm gonna to try to simplify it, even though maybe you guys have already figured it out. Should white play rook d7 or e5? And let me just say, this is hot. This is a very hot position. There's not, um, there's not a lot of room for error. Any thoughts on this one? Yeah. Well, 
while you guys are thinking about it, one thing <clears throat> that's challenging about positions like this is imagine just being in a game and you get here. It's it's hard. It's gonna be hard to know whether you think you're better or worse or equal here, right? It, it's gonna be hard to know whether you're white or black. Um, definitely, I guess if you're black, you know, imagine this was a King's Indian or a Benoni. You're just terrified that the D6 pawn is gonna fall. But likewise, black's got some runners himself. Okay, who would like to take a shot at it? I was just calling Rio, man. That guy's in a celebratory, <laughs> celebratory mood. <laughs> I'm gonna start calling on people. I don't, I don't even wanna wait. I'm cruel. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm calling on Vihan. I think, I think he wants to be unmuted. Ask to unmute. Um, so I think he bought it. Okay. Is that the rook d7 and then go g4? Uh-huh. That looks kind of scary. Very good. And what's the, what's the especially scary thing about it? Because h4 and g3 is coming. Right. And I guess what I would say is, oh, man, if he gets here, it's already a bad omen, man, because yeah. it's checked. Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. So it's kind of process of elimination, right? All right, let's go. So e5, what do you think black's best move is? Oh, behind, step down. All right. Well, hold on. I'll bring him back. It's we're we're not. Th let me just say this one's complicated. I don't know. I don't know what black. How about I play H four? Um, the, the hint I want to give you is I'm. I really want to get down here to this square, so that it comes with check. Told you this was going to be hot. <laughs> I told you this is going to be um, really hot. Let me take. Okay, let good. Take, let take on d6. All right. So, um, takes, I'm going to say check to the king. Wait. Oh, check. You're doing fine, by the way. Gotta go king, like king e3, right? Yeah, king e3. Now, I can't, I don't think black can take out. That's a real runner. Yeah. So boom, boom, boom. Now you're doing great. Try to find, this This move we could, we could call strategic. Try to find what Anderson played. Any ideas about what he did here? Maybe d7 and then king d4 and king c5 and the rook goes to d6. Uh -huh. So let's imagine d7, rook d6, king d4, king f6. King c5? I'm oh, taking your rook, seven. yeah, I'm taking your rook. Like rookie two then? But I take the pawn on d7 though. And then king c6 and try to promote the other b pawn. Okay. In which case, think about it. Now backtrack, start again here. You can get a better version of what you just did. This, this next move I would truly consider 
uh, strategic, even though it's all mathematical at this point, i.e. it's all possible to calculate it out. Maybe, wait, is it like king d4 first? Very good, king d4. When I say strategic, like, the king always has to shepherd the pawn. That's the only way it's going to work. So rook takes, king c5. Rook d8, d6. Then I'll show you how the game ended. King f6, king c6. Back, d7, f5, rook e8. How about this? Let's, let's give you one more chance. What, did the, what, what, what is the champ move here? What is the champ move here in this position? This one, this one's good to know. This one should be an intuitive move here for white. Any idea? King e6. So in all these end games, pawn end games, but also these ones, you want to shoulder the black king, the opponent's king. F3, rook f8. There's no in for the black king. Rook f4, brutal. And now he resigns. If king g3, we have king f5. Game over. Okay, beautiful. Let's do another one. This one's really intense. I'm going to flip the board. <clears throat> Obviously, black is worse. This is black to move. This is Emmanuel Lasker. This is 1910. 1910 against a dude named Schlechter. He's obviously in big trouble. This one's fascinating. Take a moment. What should black play? Uh, I don't see anyone in the waiting room. So I'm there. I, do not, I see a bunch of people, but I do not see anyone in the waiting room. Okay. Any ideas for black? Some people complaining, they feel they're bad at end games. I want to say I was terrible at end games as a kid. There's something that requires a little bit of practice. And the golden rule is if you have no idea what's going on, just, just try to be active. And what would activity mean? Obviously, in an end game like this, it would be your pawn, let's say your A pawn advancing. Uh, your king coming up and doing something. And the king can also be active, let's say, talk about the black king, uh, from a defensive posture too. And so um, imagine if you're trying to reach a Philidor position, even if you are the defender, activity means being in a blockading position to your opponent's pawn. Okay. I'm going to call him Rio. <laughs> he's, he's a genius, dude. I'm going to call on him. I, I, was gonna, I was thinking about four, but then G4, it doesn't really work due to G4. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Any other ideas? I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of like rookie four, rook C5, king of six, rook A5, rook C4, and then he's kind of passive, probably. Very good. That's see, Rio, that's why you're going to be an IM, buddy. That's why you're going to be an IM. It's that simple. Rio, while I have you on the line here, while people are considering this, and I'm going to play out your moves because they were absolutely correct, and then we'll see, we'll give people a chance to ask themselves, do they actually believe you that this is a drawn? Um, I want to ask, is that your first norm that you got? Here, let me, let me re-invite him here. 
Rio, is that oh. the first norm that you got? Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. And how old are you now? I'm almost 12. Almost 12. Dang. That's genius. That's genius, man. And do you have what's your next tournament coming up? Um, Southwest. Okay, brilliant. Brilliant. I'm so happy for you, man. That's great. And um a lot of times, you know, I'm on here and it's weird, of course, to be teaching a class uh, virtually because then I don't see people's faces and stuff. I knew Rio's name instantly, though, because he's always uh, raised his hand in these situations. All right. So absolutely, this is the answer. Now, <laughs> notice that Rio wasn't 100% sure that this was the answer. If I was playing black, maybe I wouldn't be either. But let's take a look at how the game went because it is true. It's very difficult. Uh, it, could still, it could still go wrong for us here. So white check, back and forth a bunch of times. All right, rook a2, check this one out. Rook c3, check. King g2, king e5. Rook b2, king f6. And it's just very difficult to make pro progress. And here's a nice one. He does not play f4 because then uh, rook b3 would happen, right? So uh, simply rook c6, very difficult. Complete passivity, complete passivity. So they played a couple more moves and it was a draw. So one of the things I really like about this end game is A, that the guy found it, but also just the idea that Rook activity and king activity can are often worth two pawns. It's very surprising. And especially when you go to, the, let's say, the beginning of the problem. It, that pawn on h4 feels very healthy, right? But healthy pawns need healthy pieces. <laughs> that could be a shirt. We could do a chess dojo shirt called Healthy Pawns Need Healthy Pieces. All right, beautiful. Let's go on to the next one here. And uh, this is real tricky, and I wanna do this from Black's perspective, even though it is in fact White's move here. So the first question that we're gonna ask is, whither should the king go? Should he go here or should he go here? This position as well, let's say the obvious, it's similar to our last example in that White is up what looks to be two healthy pawns. Two healthy pawns, right? Any ideas here? I would say don't don't guess it right away. People in the chat are guessing King C two probably. The issue with King C two, let's say it, is that Rook B three is going to happen, and then counterplay is going to start, right? The issue with king e2, pretty clearly, is going to be c3. And it's true. That once that pawn hits c3, it's rough. Okay. So, well, let's play king c2. That's what happened in the game. Rook d3. Okay. That much we can do. A5, rook F3, okay. A6, now someone try to tell me, why is black actually, <laughs> why is he actually okay? Take a moment here. This is, we're, gonna, we're gonna call this black to play and draw. It does not look good here, my friends. Let's be clear. <laughs> this does not look good for the guy. Would anyone like to take a shot at this? Is black to move and somehow hold on to this position? We got uh, somebody saying 
that king b4 is a draw. Maybe, maybe, maybe also not so simple with Mr. King b4. Oh, someone got it. Someone got it. Hold on, let me call on that person because that was genius. They put it in the chat. Troy, I'm gonna call on you, buddy. Let's do this. Dang, Troy got it pretty quick, dude. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't give that, I didn't give Troy that much time. And then we'll see if chess lattes, if there's a problem with chess lattes one. All right, Troy, what do you got for us? I got a work F2. Um, the only place they can go is to A3, so let's just keep checking them. So like, it's that square. Then we go to rook f3. They have to go king a4 if they uh, want to play for any advantage. And then we go rook b3. Very nice. Very nice. And this is just a genius one. This is pure genius, man. Look at this. a7. You do the honors, Troy. Yeah, we go rook b4. Yeah, rook b5. Look at that. And we check him to death. We check him to death. Very nice. Very nice. Troy. Now, Troy, maybe you can help me out. We had a totally legitimate question over here. Namely, I, th I think it was here. And we got a question, King B4. Is there a problem with King B4? Looks, it does look a little bit like a draw. Any ideas? Yeah, maybe I'm mute. I believe there might be uh, King D1 problems. King maybe D1. there's... It may be, maybe something like that. Okay, so like King D1 right now. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, good, good. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking, not 100% on this, but I could go maybe Rook A4, right, snip, yeah. A7. And there's uh, Rook F8. I, I'm, I'm going to get there. Oh, you have a, a, Rook F8. Oh, that would have been terrible Ooh. move, Cry. <laughs> that would have been a terrible move. You know, but maybe we can use that idea in your variation because we could say king d1, and then if he gets to be a fancy pants with this, then we could do rook a4. Uh, yeah, that actually seems like it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. See, I needed your help to solve that one, Troy. That was good. Okay, very well done. Let's do another one. Okay, my friends. Oh, this is white to move, and I, I might do a little bit of blah, blah here because I do think um, we should give a moment to think about this problem, position. Let's begin, I'm just gonna say some obvious things. Black has, black playing this position, you can imagine being in this position yourself. You're saying, hey, uh, yeah, I don't have as many pawns as you, buddy, but I got a beautiful rook, it's defending a7, it's attacking a2, I should be fine. Plus, my king, hey, my king is looking pretty good. White king not looking so hot. So. We need an idea here. Any idea for white in this position? Any idea? Let me see something here. Oh, okay, hold on. I had a waiting room issue. But I just solved it. <laughs> you know, you guys, I'm almost 50. I can't do all the technological things. No, especially when I'm multitasking. You know, it's hard. It's hard. Some people suggesting c5, maybe. Some people saying king h2, maybe. Um, and I guess it's kind of obvious if c5 we have to contend with bc and on king h2 we have to contend with rook a2.
Now I think we're gonna. I'm gonna try to call on Roger here. Let's see if we can get Roger here. So first of all, you want to create a mating net with H4. Uh-huh. And if the king takes, you play rook g6. Now rook g5 doesn't work due to g3, king g4, and then f. Uh, I think it doesn't. Uh, yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, I think the trade would be winning for white, but uh, but uh, if black plays rook takes a two, then you don't want to play king h two immediately because rook f two pins the pawn. Uh-huh. But now you can play f four, f five, f six. The purpose of it is to deflect the king, uh, the rook, and then after king h two, and then the rook will eventually have to move to prevent promotion, and then you play g three mate. Very nice. Well, we got some strong play today here from people. Uh, so let's go through this. Uh, one of the, um, w- let me just tell a quick story. We got a guy at the dojo and he, he said, his, his name's Mitch, he's a great guy. And he said something uh, that I was like, huh, that's so wrong, but I've heard it so many times before. Namely, what did he say? He said, the difference, how do you know when it's an end game? Honestly, and not a middle game. Honestly, let me just tell you, I don't know. I don't know when the, <laughs> when it switches over from middle game to Edgate. But he said this thing, and I've heard it before. It makes, in some ways, it makes some sense. Namely, uh, the end game happens when you stop playing for mate. And I think that's very misleading because mate, honestly, it's always there. It's always there. And if you play the end game as if mate was not on the table, oh, you miss so many chances. Because honestly, mate happens more than you'd think. And so... Let's look at h4 in this position. So h4, and black has a choice. And we're gonna look at king takes h4 first, uh, but, but we, we are gonna go back and look at the choice. So king h4, rook g6. And one of the beautiful things about rook gang games, right, is just uh, thinking about what does it mean to be active, right? And in this case, suddenly the black king went from seemingly active to just out. And so even if we don't mate the guy, it's important to see that his problems, problem isn't just mate, but the fact that he's not now able to help defend this past F1. All right, so this is the way the game went. Rook A2, F4, just like Roger said. And here he resigned. We can imagine this, A5, F5, A4, F6, A3, F7, checked to the miserable king, king H2, A2, F8. Wait, did I mess this up? Did I mess this up? A2. Did I like spring a pawn? <laughs> Four, five, six, that should be okay. Um, Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so here we're going to go um, F8, and then we go here, 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 and then mate is coming next. So there's nothing to do. Now let's go back. And the interesting point of what White's play is, I think, that let's say you go King G4. Well, we're still going to give you a check and go here, and now we can play Rook G5. So that's no good. So. King F4, and then boom. And the key point is, I think, that we've now pinned the rook on A5 to the pawn. Now, is this a complicated ending? Yes. And this wouldn't be something to, I think, something you could say, all right, I know for sure exactly how this is going to go down, at least when you're playing a game. But I think you could definitely say, that this is progress, certain progress over the beginning position. Okay, well done, Roger. That was great. Here we go. Oh, shoot. I'm always giving it away. I'm always giving it away, my friends. <laughs> this one I really like. And this one is a great example of bishops of opposite colors. And something I want to stress is a lie that I was told uh, in poorly written books 
of when I was a kid was that bishops of opposite color endings are draws. And let's just talk about why the poor books said that. They said that because there are positions where, let's say black here, could be up loads and loads of pawns, and the bishop would be able to defend them uh, because he can control all the blockading squares, in this case, the dark squares, and black cannot. Black, black can't fight for those dark squares. And so there's well-known positions that I'm sure you've all seen where the pawns can't advance. However, in a lot of ways, I think the bishops of opposite color are more decisive in terms of their results than bishops, normal bishops, bishops of the same color. Because precisely in positions like this, black has a piece on the light squares that white doesn't. So, just like in the middle game, if he can create a, uh, an attack on the light squares, then he will essentially be up a piece on those squares. Okay. So, any idea for white here? Now, I think we got, Eric is talking about a good idea, but we gotta think about it. It's rook e2, king g3, bishop e4. Unfortunately, I can just play king h3. Someone says, I miss mate. It wouldn't be the first time. It wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> it, that's, you know, and I, I know what, what I did too, is that I was, uh, anyways, I know what I did. I know what I did. It wouldn't be the first time, I know. <laughs> All right, so given Eric's lapse, we got maybe we'll be able to understand a little bit. So rookie to king h2, people are then saying h2. To it there. Though, then we have rook h1 as a problem, i.e., what are you going to do about losing the pawn? Some people are saying, what about, uh, I think it's king h4 instead of rook e2. King h4, I can play bishop f6, check. So um, one interesting idea, Sefer has an interesting idea. Sefer actually earlier was like, oh, I can't play endgames. Well, maybe he has an interesting idea. Let's get him on here. Let's get old Sefer on here, see if we can make his idea work. Oh, I thought that um, rookie to check mm -hmm. to play g5 would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Because if he goes like bishop d6, or any move, I'm going to play g4 and bishop e4. Uh huh. Very interesting. So let's let's go through it a little bit. Rook e2, king g3, g5. Now I guess the big question would be, what are you going to do on king f3? Um, maybe I would play, uh, can I play? Bishop e4 check? No. While Sefer's thinking about it, I want to say something that is so fascinating to me about these bishops of opposite color positions. Let's just say the obvious. The bishop on e5 uh -huh. getting blocked by his own pawn is a big deal. It, it hurts him that the pawn is there. Sefer, you got an idea? Don't 
think it works, but I was thinking about Rook G2, but it probably doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Yet. Hmm. Okay. It's okay. We'll, uh, we'll leave it there, and I'll take the, these arrows off. And people, somebody else might come up with an idea. We got, I think it's uh, Troy. Troy, yes, you can talk. Me, I don't know if I need to invite you, but I'm going to invite you. Buddy. It's a watch move, right? Yeah. All right, so yeah, I was thinking bishop g7. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, it's white, but black to move in this position, right? That's black to move in this position. Okay. All right. okay. Any ideas here for black? One thing, by the way, I really admire about this particular fragment is there's, I think, a lot of players, the end of a long game here, and you, you could rationalize yours to yourself. You could say something like, ah, this is a draw, man. There's nothing I can do here, you know? Uh, this player, by the way, it's kind of interesting. His name was Vasyukov back in the day. I read a book about him recently. Um, yeah, old time. Soviet guy, one of the guys they never let out of the country, you know? They were like, dude, no, you, you stay here. <laughs> you stay here. You can let the other people go play in international events, buddy, but you're gonna stay here. Anyways, champion of Moscow many times, Vasyukov, playing black here. Okay. Now, Roger's got an idea. Roger, try to make that, um, try, if, if you feel confident in that, I'm gonna call on you. Try to make it as precise as you can. I do think the idea with G5 is powerful. We need more force into our operation. All right, Madison, what's your idea, buddy? You want to come on and tell us what your idea is? Let's do it. I think we have someone in the dojo chat screaming the idea. <laughs> Someone's got screaming the idea. Um, I was thinking maybe um, Rook D2, uh -huh. check, King G3, and G4. G5, yeah. So I think king oh, f3 is forced, oh. yeah. Then maybe rook, um, I think, rook a2. Rook a2. But I'm going to play like uh, fg. And once I play fg, I'm going to guard this guy. Right? I guard that square. Now I can sack the bishop even if I have to. Because, you know, bishop and rook versus rook, draw. Yeah, I think it's just going to be a draw. I can't really undo okay. it. All right, Roger might have idea. And then we got a, a dude named Liart who's got, who's got some hectic analysis going on at the dojo. Some hectic analysis. Uh, all right, Roger, are you ready, buddy? You ready to come on? Uh, not exactly, but uh -huh. I can try. All right, let me go back to the beginning position. All right. So I think uh, rook e2, uh, uh -huh, king okay. g3, g5, king f3, and I think g4 you can sack the rook. Okay, let's take a look. So g4 takes. Then now I think, uh, I'm really not sure, but uh, but I was thinking about going king h4, so that my idea is like h2 and then king h3, it should be four. So. Uh -huh. And then you also have a g pawn. Uh, so, like for example, if white plays like king f2. Uh, uh, okay, let's try king f2, yeah. I think. Hmm. 
It's hot. For, it's definitely hot. It's not, <laughs> it's not easy, easy, but... So let me just say what you're yeah. thinking. I'll just say a couple variations for people to think about. If G3, I can go snip, H2, and I just go back, unfortunately. Yeah. And if H2, I, th I think my first question is going to be, can I just go King G2? That's going to be my first question. Now, there might be some way for you to nail me. It's true. It's true. Like that bishop is going to show up and hurt me in some way. But my rook hopefully will be able to guard whatever square. Like if you go threaten to go to here, I'll try to guard it. Now, am I certain about that? No, but that, it's not easy. Okay. Now, I want to give you, Roger, a chance. Think about it. You're so close. How can you improve your idea here? There's a stunner of a move right here, basically doing your idea. This one's a real beauty. Yeah, Narayan's got it, let's do it. H2, and I think the reason this is psychologically weird is you're like, wait a second, dude takes with check. But the bummer is on King H4, there's no like weird discover checks because this is check itself, boom. So h2, stunner of a move, white gets out of dodge, rook g5, no possible, and then what are we going to do? <laughs> Any ideas? What are we going to do here, my friends? This is a brutal one. I'll give it a moment here. It is, let's just say, in terms of Roger's idea, though, Right, We're, we've improved it because we got that full H2 temp tempo uh, without, with, you know, for free because he moved the rook over. We got the H2. All right, check to the miserable king, takes G3. And if rook H1, we have bishop B4. And here, king F3. We got this one. And it's really fascinating. This happens a lot. They, this bishop is just gone. It's not doing anything. Dude played here. King h3. Oh, man. Totally brutal. Bishop f2. g2. Mm, 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 mm. He resigned. He resigned. I thought that was a great snippet where the bishop... Poor dude, just blocked with his own pawn. And also, yeah, he was just was not able to fight for the blockade squares. And it's like we tempted him. We, we tempted, we're like, oh, you have a chance to take G5, but it never worked. It never worked. All right, one more bishops of opposite color. This is the famous Gelfand when he was a kid, I'm assuming close to your age. This is 1980 Gelfand. Let us pause and think about that for a second. This is 2021. 2022, excuse me. <laughs> Gil fans still playing. This is 1980. This is 42 years ago. And, uh, oh, where's my position, buddy? Ah, oh, cry, it would help. It would help if you had the position. Obviously, I don't have the position. That's embarrassing. Sometimes chess.com, I'll set a position up and then it will steal it from me. But that's okay, I can set this thing up. All right, let's set it up. It's a beautiful thing. Amazing, 42 years. This dude has been playing the game. Rook a4, pawn, I remember most of it, hopefully. King over here, right? Pieszka, 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 pawn, pawn. Rook, this one looks like we'll never win. <laughs> this one looks like we'll never do it. All right, so it's white to move and win. Narayan says of the last problem, saddest bishop in the world. Indeed, it was a very sad bishop. <laughs> we got a great comment in the chat. 1980, before many of the kids' parents were born. Holy moly, that makes me feel even older. <laughs> yeah. Sefer's got an amazing, an amazing variation. Sefer, let's get on here, buddy, and we'll close out the show with your brilliant variation and see if you can finish the job, buddy, with Gelfand of 1980. I thought that the move would be rook takes e4. Uh-huh. 
And then when you take bishop b8, uh -huh. and then king takes e7, uh -huh. king takes e2, king d8, or d7. If you want to get free of the bishop. All right, let's see what we can do here. King e6. Okay, king d2. King f5. King e2. E2? Okay. Uh, actually, no, e3. e3. King, king e4. Uh, king takes e4. Uh, take Bishop off to check. Yeah. Nice. Oh, Sefer, buddy, you gonna get an I am Norm like Rio? Kill that. Look at this. Bishop F2. He saw it immediately. Bam. Bam. Brilliant. Very nice, Sefer. He never didn't even hesitate. He was. He was like. He. He didn't do that thing where he was like, "Ah, oh, Craig caught me in a dirty trick. Game's over. I must have done something wrong." No, Bishop F2. Bam. Happened immediately. <laughs> Woo. We've got a great quote in chat, my friends. This is one of the better ones. Jesse is so old that his crimes against chess are no longer prosecutable because there's a statute of limitations. <laughs> That's definitely true. <laughs> I'm going to have to put that one out there in the world. That's great. <laughs> All right. I want to conclude with something. I'll probably continue with this uh, theme of tactical endgames in the next, uh, my next USCS. I don't know when that's gonna be. Greg Shahada pulls all the strings around here. I don't decide anything. Um, and what I wanna stress is some players get m more tactical endgames than others. At, for the St. Louis Chess Club, I did a lecture called The Builders and the Burners. And there are simply people who get positions that are more strategic and slow, and some people that get them more tactical. So it's not just that Fabi is the greatest tactical endgame player, it's that he gets those positions all the time, all the time. I think a great one that he got recently, I mean, he's got so many great tactical endgames, but his uh, latest victory against Faruja, amazing. Another tactical endgame. Really was some of the hottest some of the hottest positions that you can imagine. And, you know, when you play a really tactical position, you can bet that both sides are going to be making mistakes, as happens also in that game. Um, so uh, what am I going to say about the builders and the burners? Magnus often gets these little grinding positions, right? Uh, does Fabi get those? Mm, not as much. Not as much, just in the nature of the play. So, for example, if you take somebody who plays... Magnus style, let's say a London player, they're going to get more strategic endings. And if you play some wild stuff like the King's Indian, you're going to get the, the wild endgames as well. You're going to get less endgames for sure, but the endgames you do get are going to be more crazy. So we're going to pursue that in the next U.S. chess school class that I do. Maybe look at some of the tactical endgame players. All right, everybody. Congratulations again to Rio. Fantastic result. Uh, I feel like one of the things I want to do with this class is I want to know a lot of the uh, participants more than I do. And hopefully someday after COVID ends, we'll go back to the old times where we do like camps in person and I'll actually get to meet some of y'all and put, you know, faces to names. All right, everybody. That was great. And uh, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.